Thank you for all for coming. Welcome to our very special virtual public lecture uh, with Steve Kahn, the director of the VRC Rubin Observatory. Uh, I'm Carolina, I'm the coordinator of the McGill Space Institute. So before we introduce tonight's speaker, we have a few logistical details to go over. Uh, we'll be taking questions from the audience, both in the Zoom session and on YouTube. Uh, if you're joining us via Zoom, you can ask questions in the chat or using the Q&A. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can ask questions in the chat or using the comments, but just be aware that if you use anything that you say in the comments will stay there permanently, whereas the chat will not be saved. Um, so yeah, at any time you can just ask the question. I will be monitoring both streams and, and passing questions on to the speaker. Uh, we'll do a talk for about 35 minutes and then we'll move into a Q&A and we'll take all your questions. Um, so without further ado, I will pass the floor to Vicki Caspi, the director of the MSI, who will introduce tonight's session. Go ahead, Vicki. Okay, thanks, Carolina. Can everybody hear me? Uh-oh. I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes, we can hear. Okay, great. That's good. <laughs> okay, so I'm Vicki Caspi. I'm Professor of Physics Director of the McGill Space Institute. Uh, the McGill Space Institute is an interdisciplinary research center that brings together researchers from multiple departments across the McGill campus, all interested in space research of various forms. We cover topics ranging from early universe cosmology to galaxies, to compact objects, to extrasolar planets and life in extreme environments. And we really love to bring this research uh, to the public uh, in the form of these, um, these uh, public lectures. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to our signature public event this year, a lecture titled Scanning the Universe by Steve Kahn, who I'm now going to introduce. Um, Steve is presently the Cassius Lamb Kirk Professor of St at Stanford University and the director of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, also known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope or LSST. Steve graduated summa cum laude from Columbia College in 1975, received his PhD in physics from the University of California in Berkeley and um, was a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics um, uh, in the 1980s. He was also the I.I. Riby Professor of Physics at Columbia University prior to moving to Stanford. Steve served as the Associate Laboratory Director of SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory and was the Chair of the Physics Department at Stanford and Columbia Universities. He's made significant contributions to X-ray astronomy and was the US principal investigator for the development of the reflection grading spectrometer currently flying aboard the European Space Agency's XMM Newton mission. He assumed the directorship of the Rubin Observatory in 2013. He has published over 450 papers in refereed astrophysical literature. For his accomplishments, Steve has been elected fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you, Steve Kahn. Steve. So thank you very much, Vicki. Let me uh, try sharing screen now. And, uh, uh, one second. Okay, has that come across? Uh, is everybody seeing that? Looks good. Okay, great. So, um, uh, thanks again for uh, that introduction and for this invitation to uh, deliver a public lecture through the McGill Space Institute. It's uh, uh, certainly my pleasure to do this. Um, uh, it would have been nicer to have visited Montreal directly, but uh, we're all living through interesting times now with the COVID, uh, with the COVID pandemic. Uh, so let me start with just a comment about um, uh, it's not advancing. Hold it one second. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, a comment about the title, Surveying the Universe. So uh, over the past couple of decades, uh, there's been a, a kind of a sea change uh, in the way we think about astronomy and the way we've been doing astronomy. Um, of course, this discipline has for many years involved telescopes operating in different wavelength bands. 
um, largely making uh, detailed observations of individual stars and galaxies for studies of how the various systems in the cosmos operate. Um, but now we've begun to start taking very large surveys of the entire sky. Uh, this began with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was a pioneering project in the early 2000s. Uh, and it will culminate in the project that I will describe today, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Um, as I hope you'll, you'll see, the data that will be acquired by the Rubin Observatory are likely to transform nearly all fields of astronomy from our understanding of the formation of the solar system to the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole. Basically, when we do these sky surveys, we're uh, increasing the sample size of all the different kinds of objects we know about in the universe by huge factors. Uh, and that allows us to do uh, rather subtle statistical investigations of the properties of different kinds of astronomical systems, um, which is a, a, a complementary approach to, to studying uh, objects one by one. Uh, so let me say a little bit about uh, the name of the observatory. It's named after Vera Florence Cooper Rubin, um, who died unfortunately a few years ago in 2016. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Vera, she was a pioneering female astronomer whose work provided some of the most convincing evidence uh, for the existence of what we call dark matter. Dark matter is actually the dominant form of matter in the universe, but we now know that it's fundamentally distinct from all of the matter that we're familiar with here on Earth. And in particular, it does not interact with, with ordinary matter and it doesn't emit light. That's the reason we call it dark. We only know of its existence because of the gravitational forces it appears to exert. Um, but other than that, we really have no understanding of what dark matter is. It remains one of the greatest mysteries of modern physics and is the subject of extensive research. Uh, Vera's work was well recognized during her lifetime, but she never received the Nobel Prize, which many of us believe she richly deserved. Uh, and uh, it was actually an act of Congress, of the US Congress, to, to name our, uh, our project, which as Vicky said, was formerly called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope after Vera. So it is now the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And actually it's the first major national scientific facility in the US that's named after a woman scientist. So we're, we're very proud to carry that name. So what is the Rubin Observatory? Well, the idea is actually very simple. We build a telescope, a telescope that can take large format digital images of the sky very quickly so that the entire Southern hemisphere of sky, half the sky can be surveyed with these images in just a few nights. And then we do this repeatedly for 10 years. So over those 10 years, we get something like uh, 2000 images of every part of the Southern sky. Uh, it's a simple concept, but the scientific implications are actually quite profound. In particular, we'll measure everything that moves in the sky, asteroids, comets, uh, what we call stellar parallax, which is the slight motion of stars as the Earth makes its orbit around the sun, and proper motion, which is the intrinsic motion of stars. We'll measure everything that varies in time in the sky, um, ordinary variations of normal stars, stellar explosions, which we call supernovae, uh, active galactic nuclei, which are systems that contain massive black holes absorbing material from their surrounding galaxies. And in fact, when we add together all of these separate images, the 2000 or so that we acquire, we'll measure everything in the sky. We'll construct some of the deepest images that have ever been taken over the entire sky. Uh, and this will yield catalogs of something like 20 billion galaxies and a comparable number of stars. Uh, as I wrote in the abstract, it will be the first time in human history that we know of more objects in the universe than there are people on Earth. So everybody on Earth can own a few galaxies and own a few stars and look at our data to see what's happening with them. Actually, the number 20 billion galaxies is an interesting number. It turns out that that's about 10% of all the galaxies in the observable universe. The observable universe is actually finite because as we look further out into space, we're looking further back in time and 
time. And eventually we get to a time early in the history of the universe before galaxies existed. So there are believed to be about 200 billion galaxies that are possibly observable. This is not a function of how big our telescope is. This is just a function of the finite volume uh, that, uh, that is achieved by looking, to that, uh, looking back to that, to that time when galaxies first formed. And we'll have cataloged something like 10% of them, which is a remarkable human achievement aside from its scientific implications. So what, what's unique about the Rubin Observatory? Why are we able to, to do such an extensive survey? Uh, and the answer is to do with something we call the étendu. It's a French word, of course. Um, and it refers to uh, the product of the collecting area of the primary mirror of the telescope and the field of view of the camera. And that's sort of illustrated here. So at the top, is shown the Gemini South Telescope, which is a, a, a major eight meter telescope. It's actually on the same mountain uh, that the Rubin Observatory is. So that's why it's a good point of comparison. And on a certain scale, this has shown uh, the, uh, the uh, image of the primary mirror for Gemini. Uh, and then this small dot is the field of view in square degrees or represented in square degrees uh, for the largest camera on Gemini. Uh, for the Rubin Observatory, our mirror is actually not any bigger than the Gemini South mirror. And as you can see, it has a major hole in the middle. I'll come back to that later. Um, so the collecting area of the, of the mirror is not that much larger for Rubin. Uh, but on the same scale as I've shown it for Gemini, this is the field of view of the camera. And so as you can see, the product of, of this annulus times this big circle is much larger than the product of, of this annulus times this small circle. And in fact, the Rubin Observatory will have uh, at least 10 times higher aton due of any, ex any telescope on Earth. And in fact, uh, 10 times higher than anything that's, that's even planned to be developed uh, in the future uh, by any country on Earth. Uh, so that's really unique. Now the aton due is proportional to how much light is actually collected by the system, by the camera during a given observation or as a function of time. Uh, so if you have a, a smaller mirror, uh, then it takes you longer to collect a certain amount of light. But if you have a big field of view, then you're collecting more light from, from different parts of the sky. And conversely, if you have a larger mirror um, and a smaller field of view, you'll get the same number. So this is proportional to the rate at which you can scan the sky. And because the aton du of the Rubin Observatory is so large, that's what makes it possible for us to scan over the entire southern hemisphere of sky every few nights and acquire so many observations over the 10 years. Uh, this is a simulated image uh, which we've produced um, as, as to what the sky will look like for the Rubin Observatory. And you can see how dense the image is. Most of what you're seeing are galaxies actually, not stars, because as you look uh, fairly to fairly faint objects uh, further out, then, then the, the sky is actually dominated by galaxies. Now this particular picture is only one two hundredth of the full Rubin field of view. So every picture that we take with, with, uh, with Rubin will be 200 times bigger than this, but this is the density of objects you'll see. And this simulation is for a single 15 second exposure. Uh, and so every 15 seconds, we'll take another picture. It'll be 200 times this size, and you can see how many objects are collected in those pictures. And we'll have near, nearly 2000 such exposures for every part of the southern sky. So why is this hard? If this is such a good idea, why hadn't it been done before? Uh, and there were a number of challenges uh, we faced when we first conceived of this project. Uh, we needed to find a really good site, one with good seeing and a high percentage of cloud-free nights distributed evenly over the year so that we wouldn't waste a lot of time uh, due to weather limitations. We needed to invent a new kind of optical system that could deliver large collecting area with a very large field of view. The field of view for the Rubin Observatory is 10 square degrees, which is roughly 40 times the size of the full moon in the sky. So if you imagine looking up at the full moon and drawing a circle 
with an area 40 times bigger than that. That's a single picture with the Rubin Observatory. And we needed to invent a new kind of telescope mount capable of rapidly slewing to new points in the sky without wasting time settling after each motion. We're moving this massive telescope every 30 seconds. And uh, conventional telescopes, as you slew them around, take a while to settle. And you can't take a picture until they've settled. Uh, so we set a limit that we needed to be able to slew and settle within five seconds. Uh, and that had never been done before with telescopes of this size. And we needed to figure out how to build the, what will be the largest digital camera ever constructed. The camera for the Rubin Observatory is 3.2 billion pixels. Uh, it's equivalent to about 1,500 of the highest resolution, high definition tele televisions. So any one of our images, the full image, would take 1,500 HDTV screens just to display it. And we needed to figure out how to process, archive, and store enormous amounts of data. Um, over the 10 years, the Rubin Observatory will collect something like a few hundred petabytes of data. A petabyte, for those of you not familiar with the term, is 10 to the 15 bytes. So that's an enormous amount of data. It's far larger than everything that's ever been written in any language uh, in the history of humankind in the world. That turns out not to be such an impressive number. What I find a more impressive number these days, it, it will be, our database will be a few percent of all the cell phone pictures ever taken by everybody in the world. So if you think about that massive amount of data. And at the time we started this process, this project, just figuring out how to process those data quickly enough to keep up with the real data stream, how to archive it, how to make databases, how to query those databases. Those were all computational channel, uh, challenges that we had to solve. So let me go through each of those items now and just give you an idea of of what was done for the Rubin Observatory. So first the site, we chose to site Rubin in central Chile uh, in the Andes Mountains. Um, it's actually a developed astronomical site. It's also the site of the Gemini South Telescope that I spoke about earlier, and also the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. This site has extremely good weather conditions and the uh, observatory is positioned at the edge of effectively a cliff. Um, and that's what you need to get good seeing conditions. So the air comes in in a sort of laminar flow. And the first thing it sees is the telescope dome. Uh, you get turbulent cells following the telescope, uh, but those don't affect the, the images that, that we're, we're um, obtaining because they occur further downstream. Uh, this is a, uh, a artist concept of what the Rubin Observatory would look like that we drew, I would say, around 2012 or so. Uh, and this is what it looked like roughly a year ago. And as you can see, the, the building has really met our expectations. It has an unusual, the, the dome is not covered in this picture. Uh, it's still not completely enclosed, uh, but it's a lot closer than this in the current, in the current photographs. Um, this unusual shape you can see is actually takes detailed account of what the uh, prevailing wind conditions are. I think it looks a little bit more like an ocean liner than a conventional telescope. And, and there's a reason for that. So the wind comes, uh, comes from the right in this picture uh, across the dome in this direction. And so it positioned all of the services in the building downstream of where the telescope is so that the energy dissipate, the, the heat dissipation to the ambient uh, does not interfere with our, with our images. Um, I said as well that it's challenging to design an optical system that can produce such a large field of view. And the reason is that um, as you go off axis, as you start to go away from the center of the field, um, many different kinds of aberrations grow with distance and they start to disturb the system. Uh, so the design that we adopted for, for Rubin is, is this is a technical term, but it's called a modified Paul Baker design. And it's actually a three mirror design. So the light comes in and reflects off the primary mirror, which is an annulus, as you can see by the diagram I showed earlier with the hole in the middle. 
Uh, and then that is reflected to a concave secondary mirror on into a tertiary mirror, and then finally on into the camera. And the camera sits just below the secondary mirror. And there are three refractive lenses in the camera, which correct for chromatic operations. So this unusual design uh, eliminates many of the kinds of aberrations that would, you would have over a large field of view with more conventional designs. Um, after the light exiting the secondary is nearly recolonated. Um, you can also see in this picture that the tertiary mirror is very close to nearly coplanar with the primary mirror. And that um, suggested to us that perhaps we could make both of those services out of the same mirror substrate. And that's what you're seeing here. So you can kind of see the break in this picture around this line. That's the distinction between the primary mirror surface and the, and the tertiary mirror surface. Um, this mirror was fabricated at the uh, Stewart Observatory Mirror Laboratory in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and it's the first mirror that was made of this kind. It's quite challenging actually to put two different surfaces into the same glass blank because you then have a very uh, uh, limited freedom to adjust them relative to one another. In fact, we had to get those two surfaces to be coaxial uh, to within about a millimeter tolerance and over eight and a half meters in diameter. That's an amazing achievement. But we started this process quite early. And in fact, uh, the mirror was finished, uh, was actually completed um, about six years ago. Uh, and it, had, it has been in storage since, and then we've recently shipped it uh, to the mountain in Chile for installation on telescope. Uh, there's also a, a secondary mirror in the system, as I showed you. This is concave, which is also challenging to make um, an aspheric mirror uh, that's concave, partly because it's difficult to test and monitor. Uh, but this came out very well, uh, and we've actually already even coded it and you can see the, the shiny uh, color on the, um, on the surface. So I mentioned that the telescope itself is also a challenge because we're moving it around so quickly. Uh, and we needed a very stout, stiff design. Uh, and so this is what the Rubin Observatory Telescope looks like. It looks kind of like a soccer ball that you're sort of moving around. Uh, and the reason, of course, is that very stiff design allows us to prevent vibrations or other kinds of settling disturbances that would waste time during the night. So this was uh, this is a, a, a computer aided design drawing that again we drew fairly early on in the project, and this is the completed telescope. It was fabricated by a company in Spain and fully assembled in their factory, uh, and then disassembled for shipment to Chile. And in fact, that shipment occurred just about a year ago. Um, you can see the size of the components. This is just one component um, being trucked up the mountain. There were something like 35 tractor trailer transits up the mountain to get these various parts on the site. So that was an interesting activity um, just over a year ago. So let me turn to the camera. I mentioned that the camera for the Rubin Observatory will be the largest digital camera ever fabricated. Um, this is a, 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 a humongous beast. It's about 3.2 billion pixels in the camera. Uh, and the physical size is very large as well. For example, the entrance lens on the camera that I'm showing here, that's about six feet in diameter, maybe five feet, five inches, something like that. So you can get an idea of the scale of this. Um, the full length of the the camera to use metric units is about three meters. So it's roughly the size of a, a small SUV, um, which is a very large instrument, instrument for this kind of complexity. And this is the layout of the focal plane. So each of these blue squares is a 4K by 4K charge coupled device. Uh, those of you familiar with that, that's sort of the workhorse digital detector uh, that astronomers have used for about 20 years now. Um, and we group each of those sensors uh, into groups of nine, three by three arrays that we call rafts, which are shown by the red squares. And it takes 21 of those rafts to make up the entire focal plane. 
At the corners of the, of the focal plane, we put various auxiliary sensors, which are used for guiding and also for wavefront sensing. So these rafts are actually the, the key element of the camera. Um, as I said, there are nine separate detectors here and all of the readout electronics sit within the footprint of those sensors. Um, so that the output of a single of, of each raft is a single optical fiber that carries out all the digital data. So these are all custom electronics boards. These are new kinds of CCDs that we had to develop specifically for the Rubin requirements. Uh, this took us many years to perfect, uh, but it's now uh, all in place. And in fact, um, a little less than a year ago, we had fully populated the full focal plane of, um, of uh, the Rubin, Rubin camera. Uh, so you can see it here. You can sort of make out the individual rafts uh, and there are 21 of them that have been assembled. Uh, this was an extremely delicate operation. Uh, for example, these sensors are roughly about half a millimeter separated from one another when we insert the raft. Uh, and if they were to touch, we would destroy at least the, both sensors on the two sides. Each of those sensors is about over $100,000. So this is an extremely delicate operation to align all those detectors. It's kind of like parking your car in an underground parking lot where you have um, roughly a centimeter of clearance uh, on either side to the neighboring car. Uh, and so this is a picture that um, uh, Carolina included on the poster. Vicky had suggested it. You may have seen some, some news about this. So when we assembled the full focal plane, um, we decided to build a pinhole camera uh, such that we could take a picture of something before we began the precision testing uh, that's required to calibrate the observatory. Uh, and the, the quandary we ran into is that there are no existing pictures that actually had 3 billion pixel resolution. Uh, so if we used a photograph and re-photographed it with the camera, um, ultimately as you zoomed in, you would just see, um, you would see the limits and resolution of the original photograph. So we decided to use a real object and the object we pick, picked is what's called a Romanescu broccoli. Uh, sometimes it's also called a Romanescu cauliflower. Uh, and you can find it in your grocery store. It's a green vegetable. And it has this very interesting fractal structure. Uh, so if you look carefully at the picture, you can see that the patterns repeat themselves on smaller and smaller scales. So we wanted something that would have a lot of interesting structure on many different scales, which would test out aspects of the camera. And we issued a press release when we, and when we uh, released these first images with the Rubin camera. And there was intense media attention in the broccoli, actually, <laughs> more so than, than in the actual camera itself. Um, this is kind of fun. If you go on to our website, uh, you can actually zoom in uh, to this picture. Um, the size of the pinhole ultimately limits the resolution um, at coarser than our, our native pixels. Um, and you can see some other interesting effects, which have to do with diffraction by dust on the window, the entrance window of the camera and some other effects. None of those will plague us with the real camera, but they did come up in this pinhole camera configuration. So the lenses for the Rubin camera will also be, uh, the are, are already the largest refractive lenses that have been ever fabricated at this precision. You can kind of see the physical size here. This is actually the second lens. This, uh, uh, the the, the so-called L1 lens is even larger. Uh, and uh, this shows some components of the uh, mechanical assemblies in the camera uh, that move around various filters that we use to take pictures in different color bands. Um, but again, you can see the humans for comparison to just see how physically large this system is. I mentioned something about the very large amount of data that the Rubin Observatory will produce. And you might wonder, how do we get those data back to North America? How do we actually process it? We have a requirement on the system that within 60 seconds of closing the shutter on the observatory, um, we want to 
have detected everything that's changed in the image and alerted the world to all those changes so that astronomers around the world can do follow-up studies to detect transient sources, et cetera. And so we have an intricate system of optical fiber networks that get us from the mountain in Chile all the way to our processing facilities in the States. And we have a parallel processing uh, facility in France actually, which was contributed by our French colleagues. Um, so the, the, the computing system to handle all these images is a supercomputing system. It's a petascale system uh, at our Rubin archive, which will process the raw data, generating the reduced image project, uh, products, time domain alerts, and catalogs. Uh, and there are, in addition, data access centers that will make these data available to uh, end users um, in the US and Chile and in other countries. Uh, there are two kinds of data products we produce, what we call level one or the prompt data products, which are a stream of about 10 million time domain events per night, uh, detected and transmitted uh, within 60 seconds. And that will include a catalog of about 6 million small moving bodies in the solar system, uh, primarily asteroids, but also comets and Kuiper belt objects and other things like that. And then every year we'll release our static catalogs, uh, which will have about 37 billion objects and about uh, 7 trillion lines. So this is where the database technology gets challenged, uh, about 30 trillion measurements. Um, and those will be the workhorse catalogs that astronomers will use to, to query all these objects. Uh, the production of all these data products will be transparent. Uh, all of our software has been developed open source and will be available to the community at large. Okay, let me, in the brief remaining time, let me just quickly say a few words about science. There are four main science themes that have motivated the design of, of this facility. Uh, probing dark energy and dark matter, and I'll define those terms in a minute. Taking an inventory of moving objects in the solar system, exploring the transient optical sky, and mapping the outer regions of the Milky Way. So let me first talk about dark matter. Uh, as I said earlier, dark matter is intrinsically dark. It doesn't interact with the normal matter we're familiar with and it doesn't emit light. So how do we see dark matter? Well, it turns out we can see it through an effect that's called gravitational lensing. Light from background galaxies is bent by the gravitational field of intervening concentrations of dark matter in the universe. And we can see this as a distortion of the pattern of galaxies on the sky. So that's illustrated in this picture. You can infer that there's a mass concentration here at the center uh, because the galaxies behind it uh, are stretched out and distorted. Um, this is the same effect as if you were to hold a transparent lens in front of a, a, a wallpaper in your, uh, in your home or your apartment. Um, even though the lens is transparent, you can detect its presence by the distortion of the images behind it. Um, what about dark energy? The term dark energy refers to an even more mysterious phenomenon, the fact that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Uh, this was discovered in the late 90s, and it did result in a Nobel Prize, which was given to Saul Perlmutter, Adam Rees, and um, Brian Schmidt, three males, I will point out, in 2011. Um, one would naively expect the universe to be decelerating due to the gravitational attraction of all the matter in the universe. However, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is our modern theory of gravity, showed that there could be acceleration if the entire universe is filled with an energy field that has negative pressure. And we call that energy field dark energy. As for dark matter, we really have no idea what dark energy is. It is another of the current mysteries in modern physics. So how do you measure dark energy? Well, the only way we know is to make increasingly precise measurements of the cosmic expansion history. And there are various methods of doing this. You can measure the brightness of standard candles as a function of redshift. Uh, so that an example of that are type 1a supernovae, or you can measure the angular size of standard rulers as a function of redshift. And there's something called baryon acoustic oscillations that serve that purpose or you can measure the growth of structures as a function of redshift. And that can be probed through weak gravitational lensing and studies of clusters of galaxies. I won't have time to say much more about these techniques, but 
But I just will point out that the Rubin Observatory will enable each of these different methods from the same database. Okay, let's, let's move on to uh, the topic of moving bodies in the solar system. Um, so we'll detect, as I mentioned, about 6 million asteroids. And for each of those asteroids, we'll determine its orbit with reasonably high precision. And so you can play various games with those data. This is an example where the inclination of the orbit is plotted as a function of the semi-major axis for a set of asteroids that were detected with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And the color in this plot is, is a false color, but it's indicative of different surface properties of those asteroids. So you can see the green ones have one particular kind of, of spectrum or appearance, if you like, the orange another, the blue and the red. Now for every one of these points, you know its orbit. So you can trace the orbit forward in time, but you can also trace it back in time. And what you find when you trace it back in time is that all of the blue, the blue objects coalesce at some early point in time to the same central object. And similar for the green and for the orange and for the red. And that's not terribly surprising. It means that the small bodies that we see in the solar system were produced by fractionation. Larger bodies ran into one another over the history of the solar system. They broke apart and the various pieces then continue on in their Newtonian orbits by themselves. Uh, and so studying this allows us to chart the actual history of the solar system from its time of formation uh, until the current day. Uh, one important sample of asteroids are those which are potentially hazardous in that their orbits might actually intersect the Earth. Uh, and this is a plot of what we believe uh, the distribution of those asteroids are as a function of their size or brightness, or if they hurt the, uh, if they hit the Earth, uh, how much energy they would impart in megatons of, um, of TNT, which is a standard unit for explosions. Uh, so at the very large end of this plot, these objects, if they hit the Earth, would be pretty catastrophic. Um, but as you can see, they're, they're quite rare and the number is much lower. Uh, at the faint end, um, uh, smaller objects, there are many more. The red line in this plot indicates those objects which are actually known as of about 2014. And the big objects are dangerous, but we know where all of them are and none of them will hit the earth in the near, in the near future. However, as you get smaller, um, as you can see, the extent of our lack of knowledge is quite dramatic. Now this region right around um, 100 meters or so is particularly interesting. Those objects are big enough to actually get through the atmosphere and impact the earth. Uh, but as you can see, our knowledge of them is still very incomplete. So this is where the danger potentially is. Uh, the most likely thing for an object like that to do is to fall into the ocean, of course, since most of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean. Uh, but that's still quite dangerous because it will create tsunami waves, which will impact uh, coastal cities all over the Earth. So this is, this is an issue of concern. And um, I won't go through this quickly, but um, the Rubin Observatory is sensitive enough to detect these sort of 100 meter objects all the way out to the main asteroid belt. So it's a very good uh, alarm system for these potentially hazardous asteroids. Um, let me talk briefly about exploring the variable sky. Um, many different kinds of stars in the sky vary, some regularly, some erratically. Uh, this is a, a sort of a rough plot of the amplitude of variations as a function of the the period for, for periodic sources. And these objects which fall at different places on this plot have different names. They correspond to different kinds of, st of stars. With the Rubin Observatory, we'll acquire samples 100 to 1,000 times bigger of all of these classes of objects, which will, of course, uh, aid in our understanding of those systems. But the most exciting thing is probably what we call transient sources which are things that literally uh, go bump in the night, that explode, are there for some short period of time, and then fade away. Um, and this is a plot of you know, what various kinds of transients are as a function of the characteristic time scale that they vary versus how bright they are. And you can see a lot of these things have names, but there's a big section of this plot down here where the words are 
where there aren't any points. And the reason is not that there's nothing there. It's just that we've never been able to look there. We've never been able to search for faint objects that vary on fast time scales. And Ruben will provide that capability and hopefully lead to lots of new discoveries of things we never knew about before. And then finally, the last topic, um, just uh, studying the Milky Way. We get tremendous information about our own galaxy because we can make distance measurements to the stars in the galaxy. We can make those distance measurements because of parallax and proper motion. By seeing the subtle movements of stars in the sky, we can determine their distance. And then we can do various things um, with Rubin Observatory. We'll, we'll be able to uh, map the colors of stars, determine their structure, how old they were, all the way out to 200 kiloparsecs or so, which is basically all the way out of the galaxy. And if you, if you look at very high, large distances and you filter out all the nearby stars, what you find is that our galaxy is surrounded by what we call tidal streams. The largest is the Sagittarius stream, but you can see there are faintest ones, fainter ones here and, and there. Those correspond to previous satellite galaxies of the Milky Way that over cosmic time have fallen in and had their, their, their stars, their constituent stars, tidally stripped away from them as they fill. So we see these streams, which give us the orbits of those satellite galaxies as they fell into the Milky Way. So again, that gives us a, the history of how the Milky Way was assembled over cosmic time. So that's a, a very quick summary of the project and of some science. I have one slide here on COVID impacts. Um, it's been an especially interesting year. Uh, this is a billion dollar project and um, it's, I will say trying uh, and difficult to complete a $1 billion construction project in the midst of a global pandemic. We had to shut down uh, work at all of our sites in March of 2020. We were able to renew some camera work at Slack at Stanford at the end of May, but everything has remained idle in Chile until this month. Uh, in particular, the dome contractor uh, company is Italian and the company that built the telescope mount is Spanish. They both went home in March. Um, in the meantime, the Chilean border is currently closed to non-Chileans. So we've been working with the government to have these uh, key vendor uh, support people uh, declared um, essential to the Chilean government so we can get special exceptions to get them back in the country. We now hope to resume work on the telescope mount in January. The total delay in the project will be about nine months to one year. It's been difficult to maintain morale during this period, but our team is very committed, fortunately. So this is my last slide. I'll just summarize here. Um, the Rubin Observatory will initiate a new era in survey astronomy with major impacts in a wide variety of fields. Project's been very technically challenging, but we're well on track before COVID-19 hit us in March. Nevertheless, we still expect to begin uh, our 10 years of operations uh, in 2023. We have a very dedicated construction team and a large and diverse side of the community. So we all eagerly wait uh, completion. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Steve, for the super interesting talk. Uh, so now we're gonna move into the Q&A. We have a few questions that came in while you were speaking, uh, but everyone feel free to ask more questions uh, as, they, as they come up. Um, so I'm gonna start with the ones that we got while you were talking. So um, what is the redshift limit to which galaxies like our own can be seen? Yeah, we will be able to detect um, galaxies of, of roughly the size of the Milky Way out to about redshift one. Um, and then there's a sort of a distribution, um, but around where redshift one is where most of our sensitivity will be. So um, in a single exposure, we get down to 24th magnitude for people familiar with astronomical notation. Um, and over the 10 years, we'll get down to about 27th magnitude. Um, okay, so we have another question from the audience. Uh, with so many satellites being launched these days, will this become an issue for the observatory or will data processing eventually just ignore their site? Yeah, systems. that's a very good question and one that's been a big issue for us over the last few months. So um, as you know, a number of companies around the world are planning to la launch tens of thousands of telecommunications satellites. 
uh, to basically provide um, high speed uh, internet access everywhere in the world. Um, any individual satellite by itself is, is not so much of an issue, but having tens of thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit will certainly affect us. So these, these satellites reflect uh, sunlight um, uh, and that sunlight gets, gets into our camera and because they're moving, we see a streak. Uh, the satellites are not hard to discriminate from real astronomical objects because of the streak, um, but they can get in the way. And the biggest concern is actually not just the individual streak itself, which even for tens of thousands of satellites um, is only affects a, a small percentage of our total pixels. Uh, however, uh, for bright objects, there can be ghosts of these streaks that can affect larger parts of the field of view. Uh, so the, the first company that really got in this business was SpaceX, and we started working with them. Um, and we've made a lot of progress um, with their help. Um, they were able to um, design um, uh, various techniques that would decrease the brightness of their, of their satellites as they launched, and uh, that's reduced the problem. Whether other companies will follow suit remains to be seen. So far, we've gone furthest with, with, with SpaceX, but uh, several of the others have contacted us as well. The Rubin Observatory is the primary facility on Earth that will be affected by these satellite trails. We have a, a raised hand, so let's see if it works. Ken, can you talk? No, I apologize. I did not want to raise my hand. So great talk, though. Thank you for, for allowing me to say that. But no, I don't have a question. Sorry. OK, so we do have a few more questions from YouTube. Look, we're going to go over to YouTube now. Um, so we have, will the data set be available for citizen scientists at the same time that for professional astronomers? Yes, that's a good question. So um, our major funding agency in the United States is the National Science Foundation. Uh, and a key element of uh, their um, research programs is what they call broader impacts. Uh, so we've been able to use that uh, to devote substantial amounts of money to our education public outreach program. Uh, and uh, we have a staff of about 10 that have been working um, to create a variety of kinds of outreach projects, uh, uh, both or products, uh, both for classroom teaching, uh, for planetaria and other museums, but also for citizen science. Citizen science is a very active field right now, um, started in astronomy with Galaxy Zoo a number of years ago. Uh, and um, we've, we have a number of projects that are uh, nicely tied to the Rubin data uh, that um, an, an interested uh, citizen science community can get actively involved in. Uh, we think this is one of the most exciting aspects of the project, actually, that uh, the Rubin Observatory will um, sort of bring home the universe uh, to a very large number of people because they can directly play with the data on their own. Well, that should lead to some, to some really interesting things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have another question from YouTube. So it has for well-known targets such as glob globular clusters. Does a Rubin Observatory offer any special advantages? So the, we, we will not do um, specific, except for very rare kinds of science, which I'll mention in a minute. We will not do specific observations with the Rubin Observatory of individual objects. So our intent is to provide a kind of a uniform scanning strategy across the entire sky. But as I mentioned earlier, we'll detect huge numbers of objects and we'll increase the sample size. So we will, uh, we will just by scanning so much of the sky, um, we will dramatically increase the known globular cluster populations around nearby galaxies. Uh, and so that, that, that is a key element of Rubin science, um, but it's not for necessarily providing better observations uh, than I've already done them around particular galaxies, but just, just increasing the sample size by a lot. Um, I just mentioned that the, the one class of, of systems where we might actually you know, interfere with our basic scanning strategy and point the telescope is for gravitational wave events. 
Um, gravitational wave events, um, as many of you are probably aware, we detected for the first time a few years ago, and now there's a, a, a significant population of uh, gravitational wave sources that have been observed. Um, the error boxes that come with those sources are sufficiently large that it's inefficient for many telescopes to try to go search around to find the counterparts. But our 10 square degree field of view is very well suited to that. Uh, and these are rare enough or infrequent enough uh, that it's, it's not a major commitment of time from the observatory for us to follow those up. Uh, we have another question from YouTube, uh, which is uh, how far north of the celestial equator uh, could the Rubin Observatory see from its location in Chile? Are you planning to map part of the northern hemisphere sky or only the southern hemisphere? Yeah, our main emphasis will be the southern hemisphere sky. We are planning to go north, particularly for the ecliptic, uh, largely for the solar system science. So we'll, we can get up to about, I think it's about 20 degrees north of the equator. Obviously, that's going to be at, at higher zenith angles uh, and therefore decreased sensitivity. Uh, but we will do those observations, uh, especially for the solar system science. But most of our coverage will be devoted to the south. Uh, we have, now we're going back to the Zoom chat. Uh, we have another question. So alignment of the CCDs in the raft is very demanding, as you've ex explained. Should individual rafts or their CCDs shift during shipment to Chile, will realignment on site be possible? Yeah, we have a, a clean room facility on the summit uh, where we can reproduce many of the uh, activities we undertook um, uh, when we assembled the camera at Slack. But I will point out that, um, of course, this was modeled uh, extensively how much movement is possible with the, the rafts. The tolerances are quite tight. Um, uh, the Rubin Observatory is a very fast optical system. It's F1.2 which means the, um, the flatness requirement on a, a very large focal point, which is about 60 centimeters in diameter, is at the 10 micron level. So we're, we're quite sensitive to small motions, uh, but the rafts themselves, the resonant frequencies are very high. Uh, for the shipment trials that we've done, we're not anticipating any disturbances. We, we would have the capability of removing a raft and remounting it if necessary, but we don't think that will be necessary. Uh, we have a bit of a, clar a couple of clarifying questions from YouTube that are slightly related. Uh, I'll ask the one that came in later first and then I'll go to the other one. Um, so we have a question here that says, is matter somewhat evenly distributed in the universe or are there areas that are either almost empty or extremely dense? So on, on large scales, the universe is remarkably homogeneous and isotropic, but there is a lot of structure as you can see in the nearby universe by the existence of stars and galaxies. The, the initial universe, very early in the history of the universe, was highly uniform. Um, but the universe is gravitationally unstable. Uh, so if there's slight overdensities of mostly dark matter, then just gravitational attraction will make those slight overdensities uh, grow with time. And that's what we believe happened in the universe. Uh, so those initial uh, slight overdensities eventually became the first stars and then the first galaxies, and then the first clusters of galaxies. And we can trace that history. So the detailed distribution of matter in the universe is a complex network of filamentary type structures, but on larger scales, it's, it's very uniform and isotropic. Good. Um, so we have one of the earlier ones. So are atmospheric turbulences taken care of by adaptive optics? Yeah, so um, as you probably know, for, for certain large telescopes, which are planned or under construction now, uh, they will utilize adaptive optics to try to cancel the effects of the atmosphere, uh, remove the atmospheric seeing. And it turns out you can only do this over a small field of view. And the reason is, if you think about it, if, you, if your camera covers a large field, uh, then different directions within that field uh, at the height of the turbulent layers of the atmospheres will correspond to physically distinct uh, 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 density and homogeneities. So one can't correct for everything at the same time. Um, so you cannot do adaptive optics 
on, uh, on a, a wide survey telescope uh, like the Rubin Observatory. What we can do, however, is to adjust for um, small changes in the figures of the mirrors that come from thermal effects or gravitational effects as the telescope points around the sky. And so our, our mirrors are highly actuated um, and the camera is highly actuated and we will continuously uh, being uh, adjusting those figures to improve the images. Uh, we call that active optics rather than adaptive optics, uh, but that is a feature of the system. Um, can one obtain spectra of the objects which are being detected? Not with the Rubin Observatory. The Rubin Observatory is purely a imaging facility. Um, we do make images in six different color bands, but uh, that's the extent of the spectroscopy we do. But one of the reasons for issuing the alerts uh, within 60 seconds is to enable other telescopes around the world to quickly follow up, particularly for transient events, which are, which are unique or of, of a special interest. Um, there are some spectroscopic facilities that, are, that are, have been designed with, uh, with instruments that could do large spectroscopic surveys. And there's obviously uh, tight coordination with us. And so we believe that most of our, or not most, but a, a, a significant fraction of the objects we detect will be studied uh, spectroscopically by other facilities. We have a couple more questions about the kinds of objects that will, can be detected. Uh, so the first one is, uh, will we be able to find exoplanets using the Rubin Observatory? Um, yeah, but Rubin Observatory is not perfect for exoplanet science, but it does do something. So we will have very high probability of finding what we call hot Jupiters, which are exoplanets roughly the size of, of Jupiter in our solar system. Uh, but hot, meaning that they're closer to their, to their parent star. Uh, and the reason we'll find those is that uh, they cause transits. transits. They'll ca cause slight periodic dimming of their parent star as they move in front. Uh, and, and given our 2000 or so observations of every part of the sky, uh, we'll detect those dimming events. So we will find hot Jupiters out to the edge of the galaxy. We'll have a very large population of them. Now those objects will not be habitable planets. Uh, so they're of less uh, interest, particularly for questions about life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, but they will tell us a lot about, um, you know, comparative solar systems or stellar systems uh, and what the planet demographics look like. Um, for smaller planets that are further out, the chances, the numbers are much less impressive, but we will have some events along those lines. Okay, and then on a related note, um, I lost the question. Uh, do you have any predictions for how many transients Rubin Observatory will detect per week? Yeah, so we um, will detect 10 million time domain events per night. So every night there will be 10 million events that will have things that have changed in the images. Um, now, um, so that's not the sort of time stream that you're going to take on your cell phone and <laughs> as an alert uh, type thing. Um, most of those, those events will be rather boring. They'll either be asteroids or they'll, that have moved from one place to another, show up as, so show up as a, a new star, uh, or they'll be ordinary variable stars. But even if you take out all of those known objects, we'll end up with about 100,000 per night. And so the real question then is, how do you classify those and how do you find the needle in the haystack, the really interesting events out of the 100,000? And, uh, and that will depend on the color information we have, the history of variations of that object, what else is known from other wavelength bands. But this is currently an active area of research of what we call event brokers to figure out how to take this very large data stream of time domain events and, and find the objects that are worthy of follow up with other facilities.
Uh, Caroline, I didn't hear you then. Yeah, we have one last question. <laughs> um, so with data sets of this magnitude, what was selected as the storage medium to balance cost versus speed of access? Yeah, so we, our, our primary, you know, we started planning this project in the early 2000s and technology of course has evolved a lot um, since then. Um, but we've been keeping track of it and, and replanning. So we're still planning tape storage um, with, um, you know, not a small amount of data, but not the entire database available uh, on disk at any given time. So it's a kind of an intricate management system of what gets moved to disk and what's, what gets kept on state tape storage. But there'll be, uh, you know, robotic arrays of, of, of data tape bags to, to um, with some kind of latency to provide data based on the queries we get from the community. The, the active re data releases will be maintained on spinning disks, so those will be instantly accessible. Okay, um, I think we finally run out of questions. That was just a really great talk. Uh, it got tremendous response. So I would like to, uh, first of all, thank everybody for coming to the lecture and thank you, Steve, for a really wonderful uh, lecture. That's just tremendous science, very, very exciting. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to uh, seeing the Rubin Observatory be a, a tremendous success under your under your um, reign. So Great. thank you, uh, thank you again. All right, thanks very much for having me and I appreciate the attention and have a nice evening. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay, bye everyone. Oh, I should wait, I, should, I forgot. Most important, Carolina, thank you so <laughs> much for organizing all this and running the show here so professionally and so well. This was worked out fantastically. We've got a great, great audience and very smooth. So thank you very much, Carolina, for all your efforts. Yeah, thank you, Carolina. You're welcome. Thanks for both of you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Okay.